is listening to that litany <laughs> of uh, past campaigns, I, I should explain myself. I think the grand total for the two of us is 11 of these things. <laughs> and it frankly dawned on me why that was. The powers that be basically decreed that we would keep watching presidential campaigns until we got one right. <laughs> And unfortunately, we've had to retire without the, without the success. Um, the, uh, I've been having a debate with myself uh, for the last couple of days about whether it would be proper or appropriate to compare and contrast President Clinton and President Kennedy. I know President Clinton would like me to. <laughs> um, and I finally decided it might be a worthwhile exercise to kind of understand this enormously improbable event that Curtis and I have written about. Um, and not only that, um, but that it raises a question that I think is pretty central to modern national and presidential politics. Namely, how do you get from outside in? How do you get from nowhere somewhere? How do you take on, to call it improbable is a gigantic understatement, an improbable exercise uh, with uh, all the standard wisdom against you? And that's what I think makes it relevant. Uh, and certainly causes Curtis and me to think back upon that day. What was it? Midsummer, late summer, 1991, when it started here. October. Late summer, right? October. 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 <laughs> I remember coming down. And to try to think back on the situation at that time. The biggest national story was uh, who had decided not to run for president against uh, president, which we've been through. God, I never saw so many Hamlets in one year as we saw that year. Uh, Jay Rockefeller, uh, Dick Gephardt, who had run just four years before. Uh, the, the stampede was to the exits, not to the stage. Um, and here was this guy who everybody knew had promised us the wazoo, right? Um, he was young, he was interested. But he was nowhere. He was uh, nobody nationally. Um, and on top of that, uh, he, he had no obvious route uh, to the nomination of his party, much less uh, to uh, success in the general election against the sitting uh, president, except his belief that it could potentially happen. And uh, it's important to emphasize this idea that Governor Clinton had nowhere to go. Uh, this was going to be a year where Iowa was off the table. There was a guy from Iowa in the race. So you couldn't start there. Uh, New Hampshire was starting to look <coughs> impossible in terms of victory because another one of these regional figures uh, from New England was already starting to run and look formal enough. So the question arises. How, how are you supposed to do this? Where are you, how do you start winning so that you have a shot at the nomination? And Clinton's answer uh, was built on a structure that first came from John Kennedy. That's why I think that comparison is that way. And it has to do with the, A, the primacy of the primaries, and B, the primacy of retail policy. Um, all Clinton did after he left here that sunny day was go to the early voting states and work his tail off. I mean, it was a, it used to be a lot of fun to pick up his appearances in New Hampshire and South Dakota and some of the southern states just because uh, there was hardly anybody there. He worked like a dog. There was always somebody with him to put down the name, address, and phone number of everybody he bumped into in the course of the day. Uh, on any given day, you didn't see the needle move at all. You saw it move 
accumulatively over time. And that's what I think the compare and contrast gets interested in. You know, one of the mistakes I think people make in looking at presidential politics through the lens of history is that you warp it with a, a coloring of inevitability, as if how it came out in the end is what matters instead of what it took to get there. John Kennedy was a nobody when he started. One of the things we discovered was that he actually started after Thanksgiving in 1956. He was running in 57. Um, and, uh, uh, but under a system that would appear to make someone like him, who hadn't done anything, who was really young, who in the middle of an extremely tense period of the Cold War brought no governmental experience of obvious relevance uh, to the table, um, he had no roots into important sources of power in his party. Um, and uh, to the conventionally wise in Washington and around the country, uh, he was an interesting guy like Clinton. He was a talented guy like Clinton. But the consensus was that no one could see how he could possibly succeed given the enormous and substantial forces in his party who would be uh, seeking the nomination uh, also. And the final point, which is a direct comparison, when Clinton started, there was this great big huge cloud over the whole thing, and nobody knew what would happen to the cloud. And the cloud, of course, was Mario Cuomo, whose entry into the race would instantly transform the way it was looked at, whether the guy won or lost, it was he was an enormous presence on the national scene at the time. And a lot of people who didn't run either thought President Bush couldn't be beaten or thought Governor Cuomo couldn't be beaten. Not Bill Clinton. In Kennedy's case, the great big huge cloud was Lyndon Johnson. Not necessarily in any of the 16 primaries that JFK contested by the late spring of 1960. But rather, as the power broker in a system which at that time didn't really have much room for a, a special interest group Kennedy was interested in. This special interest group was called uh, voters. And when he ran in 1960, voters were not an important the system barely took notice of a few primaries. But the business of getting ready for a national campaign was supposed to be in the hands of what Richard Nixon used to sneeringly call the so-called better people, bosses, governors, power, powers in their own states and regions, who came together at national conventions and discussed things and either made deals or chose uh, and that that's how it was done. Uh, and obviously, the only chance that Kennedy had was to assault this system from the outside, which, of course, is what he did. And as we've tried to chronicle, in the process, he completely changed the game. No one had ever hired a pollster of his staff before. Nobody ever invented, invested in these weird things called 30-second television commercials. Um, uh, and on and on and on, one first after another, all designed to tear down the walls of this system. And the result was that at least there was an opening for people like, think of all the outsiders who came afterwards because of Kennedy, the, the, the system that Kennedy tore down. Barry Goldwater, Ronald Reagan, Jimmy Carter, Barack Obama, I'll leave one other one aside for a second. <laughs> um, but, uh, but suddenly, or gradually, in the 60s and 70s, voters came to matter more. And I just want to close the introductory part of this show with uh, an observation that leads to now. Uh, at the beginning of 1960, as all of this was 
beginning to unfold. <coughs> Kennedy got into a private argument with the premier newspaper columnist of his day, Walter Lippmann, who was really a jerk and, and the ultimate elitist, but wise as hell. And he was one of the few people who understood exactly how Kennedy was intending to proceed through the primaries first and then to the sources of power within the party, not the other way around. And Lippmann said this is a call. Presidential nomination should go, should be chosen by the wise men of their party, the men with the most experience, the men with the best judgment, and then we can sit around together and decide who really would be the best choice for our nomination. And then once this judgment had been made by a small group of people, well, we can make it to a convention and sing some songs and then go out and run a campaign. But the business of choosing nominees really belongs uh, in the hands of an elite group. And what Kennedy is doing is very dangerous. In fact, he said, it's so dangerous that someday somebody will come along and he will put me to be with, with dark appeals to emote things like emotions uh, and resentments. And the result is something that nobody who thought about it really would intend to happen will nonetheless happen. And America is quite capable, given its history, if we let the voters into this process of electing a demagogue. And maybe after all these years, Lippmann had a point. <laughs> um, and a final point that they all share. I, it's our belief that every important American story is punctuated by race. Um, and race is always near the center of JFK's long effort and his long evolution from a horrible civil rights figure to a genuine one. Uh, and it permeates every campaign since 1960. And Curtis can expand on that and anything else that's on his enormous mind. Right, Curtis? little mind, but uh, before I start, I'd just like to thank you all for having me back and Tom. Uh, we both were here uh, with the Clinton campaign in 92 and back uh, not as often in 96, but uh, it's always fun to be back uh, in, in Little Rock. And I, I can't help but say this. I, I try to remember it. Uh, I see a number of people my age here. My first visit to Little Rock was in 1960, the same year Kennedy was elected. It was a football game here, and uh, we kicked a field goal on the last play of the game. Do you guys remember that? Uh, not many of you do. Usually people jump up and say, it was wide, it was wide. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm old Miss, so, uh, so, so anyway, so it's good to, good to be back, but to get back on track, um, I guess to, uh, try to flesh out some of what Tom's talking about, race, and of course, Clinton was, was, was quite adept in dealing with the race issue, and he built uh, a strong constituency, un unlike uh, Bill Clinton, I'm sorry, like uh, John Kennedy. Uh, and um, just to go back to the, kind of the beginning uh, in, in 56, 57, um, Kennedy really had no standing with the black community. He didn't understand black people. He had no black friends. He had no staff member who was black. And he went to the Chicago convention in 1956, uh, where Adlai Stevenson was going to get the Democratic nomination again, uh, thinking that Stevenson might throw it to the delegation to choose his running mate, which is, of course, what happened. And that's really uh, the beginning of the Kennedy uh, emerging star that he ran and uh, in a very spirited battle that went on all afternoon for that nomination. Incidentally, it's the last time that any uh, vote at a national convention has gone past the first ballot. Uh, 
and it wound up a dogfight between Senator Estes Scafalber of Tennessee and John Kennedy. At one point, Kennedy came within about 20 votes of winning, and then there was a, a surge for Scafalber. But out of all of that, Kennedy was supported almost unanimously by all the Southern delegations against this guy from Tennessee. Because basically, it's not so much they thought Kennedy was great. It's an unknown young senator from Massachusetts, but they all hated Estes Kefauver's guts because he had refused to sign the Southern Manifesto. Uh, Skip and Tom and I were just talking before we came on, trying to remember who refused to sign it, and I believe it was only old Senator Gore from Tennessee, Kefauver, and your own Brooks Hayes from Arkansas. I believe they were the only three Southerners that did not signed it. But anyway, as a result, Southern delegations hated Kefauver. So they all voted for uh, John Kennedy. Kennedy made a crack as he's leaving Chicago. Uh, he told Arthur Kroc, who at that time was a famous columnist for the New York Times, I'll be whistling Dixie from now on. Uh, and part of his campaign plan, which as Tom said, really started uh, later that year and was a, a running operation by 1957. Uh, uh, he had his own Southern strategy, and that was to court all the conservative Southern Democrats, the segregationists. Tom and I spent a lot of time uh, researching at the Kennedy Library, and uh, we found a lot of interesting uh, things. We found love letters between JFK and George Wallace uh, Balbus, um, let's see, uh, Bull Connor voted for him uh, from Alabama. I mean, it was quite a rogues gallery of people that, that uh, JFK was playing footsie with. Uh, there was a guy named Jim Gray who was leading uh, uh, segregationist in Georgia. That, uh, and uh, Kennedy, Kennedy uh, made uh, these, these trips of uh, uh, all the southern states um, and so uh, he thought he was building uh, uh, a coalition down here. Uh, but it was a tightrope he was trying to, to, to walk. And important to remember that at that time, um, there were not many blacks able to vote in, in the South. And yet blacks held a balance of power in a number of the northern states where they could vote. And Kennedy should not have ignored them and finally realized he could not. And uh, there was, uh, Tom mentioned uh, the specter of Lyndon Johnson. Uh, as this long four and five year campaign went on, uh, Kennedy came to realize for all of his work down here, that the people really belonged to Lyndon Johnson, that Lyndon Johnson would, would, would get their support at the end, and also he began to realize, and he was uh, uh, pounded by uh, some of the prominent blacks in the party, uh, some of their sympathizers in the labor movement, that he could not um, um, abandon uh, them uh, in his attempt to uh, try to draw in the Southerners. And so uh, finally, Kennedy, I think, began to come to his political senses uh, late 59 and in early 60, and he had one critical meeting with a, a group of blacks from Michigan. He sent Caroline, his campaign plane, over to Detroit to bring them back, and they had a, a, an all-day soiree, in, including lunch at uh, the Kennedy home in Georgetown. And they had a good, as they say in diplomatic circles, full and frank exchange of views. And these blacks from Michigan really uh, told it to him and warned him. Uh, uh, it was at his peril that he uh, keep dealing with the South and not show any interest in, in, in them. And so that was really the beginning of this, this change in, in the Kennedy uh, campaign, and then, of course, uh, uh, ironically, he left it to Lyndon Johnson to be the one to try to carry the South in the, uh, in, in the general election. 
And you know, there's one other, and this is too long a story to get into, but um, we have uh, almost a chapter in the book about uh, the decision, which was not carefully thought out, but uh, it was one Kennedy made on impulse to make the call to Coretta King in October of 1960, just basically a call of sympathy after Martin King had been arrested in Georgia and, and eventually thrown in a notorious uh, prison in, in Georgia. And Mrs. King was clearly, uh, and for obvious reasons, fearful for her husband's life. And Kennedy uh, finally was uh, someone who finally got to him to uh, ask him to make the call was Sergeant Shriver. Virtually everybody else on the Kennedy campaign said it's a terrible idea. You don't want to get involved because you'll jeopardize the South. We're doing just fine with LBJ. But Kennedy did. He called Coretta King. Uh, she immediately shared the word with uh, uh, King's father, uh, Daddy King, who was really a more powerful politician than his son. Uh, and uh, suddenly there was this groundswell of support for Kennedy for making the call because Nixon did nothing. Uh, he was approached uh, by the King interest also because King was neutral and uh, Nixon, Nixon did nothing. So in the closing days of the campaign, uh, the Kennedy operation printed up literally millions of leaflets that were known as the blue bombs that uh, depicted John Kennedy as this great savior and um, uh, uh, advocate of civil rights and he had made the call to Mrs. King, and Nixon did nothing. And these were distributed in, in the black community, and especially at the churches on the Sunday before the election. There was one great line that uh, was one of Adam Clayton Powell's lieutenants at Harlem. Uh, his name was the Fox, the Fox Jones, who says that not only are they big, going over big in the churches, they're big in the bars in Harlem. So. Uh, uh, in the end, uh, uh, I think it's generally believed that if there was one major difference that tipped the balance for Kennedy, it was the call to Coretta King. Um, President Eisenhower said after the election he felt that was what threw it to, uh, to Kennedy. So it's interesting. Uh, it was an interesting uh, tightrope that Kennedy walked between the. Uh, the south and the north. And anybody can yell at us if you want to. <laughs> we, you know, we, can, we can go on a little bit. Uh, you know, the other thing I thought's worth mentioning is, uh, you know, in, in, uh, it, you know, if you compare Clinton and Kennedy, uh, they had certain handicaps to overcome. And with uh, Clinton, I think, to a certain extent, was regionalism. That back then, still, Clinton was a Southerner. There were a lot of suspicions. And they probably were exacerbated because of Jimmy Carter, who we all thought had shattered the myth that no Southerner could get elected. And then it was, not a, it was a failed presidency. And I remember, uh, I think it was, uh, Dale Bumpers, who said, yeah, he didn't want to run again because Carter had spoiled it for Southerners for another 20 or 30 years. But uh, uh, the one uh, similar handicap that Kennedy had, and I had forgotten how huge it was, but was Catholicism. It was an enormous issue. And uh, uh, the just a couple of things because we, we have a lot in the book. But uh, one of the things they were uh, dealing with was uh, an organized campaign by evangelicals who were trying to convince uh, the rest of uh, America that if Kennedy's elected, uh, the Vatican will control the country and Kennedy will follow the orders of the, of the Pope. Um, the Kennedy people, uh, knew that they were going to have to confront it. And they did a remarkably good job. They started off very early. Sorensen put together, Ted Sorensen, Kennedy's speechwriter, uh, put together a report saying, uh, 
okay, there's a Catholicism, but it can be an advantage. He pointed out how uh, there's so many Catholic voters uh, in urban areas in, in the country who will gladly vote for a Catholic, and they put together a report and hooked it up and put it under another name, got a lot of press out of it. The other thing Kennedy did, he confronted the issue, unlike Al Smith in um, 1928, the uh, Democrat who was uh, nominated that year who was Catholic and got wiped out, and a lot of people attributed to Catholicism, and Sorensen's report argued that, that wasn't it at all, but there were other problems with Smith. But what I thought was particularly interesting, uh, and it kind of led to the, the famous Kennedy appearance in Houston uh, late in the campaign when he spoke to the Protestant ministers there, was a meeting in the summer of 1960 in Switzerland where uh, about 25 evangelical leaders were called there by none other than the, the Reverend Billy Graham, who was having uh, uh, first name uh, letter exchanges with Dick, Dick Nixon, dear Billy, Dick, dear Dick, what can we do to destroy the Kennedy campaign? And one of the ringleaders was another guy named Norman Vincent Peale. And they had an active conspiracy between the Nixon campaign and these evangelical ministers. And the Kennedy people basically just outsmarted them. You know, they, they, uh, Kennedy was, uh, was proud of his Catholicism. He never ran from it. He had an argument that I lost my brother Joe in World War II. And because we're Catholics, does that mean I'm not qualified to run for president? Uh, it finally all led to the confrontation in Houston. And uh, Kennedy, I think, you know, clearly won that uh, battle there so much so the Kennedy campaign used clips from that speech to the ministers for their own campaign uh, issues. And uh, Kennedy wins. And when have we heard Catholicism be an issue since then? One of, the, one of the things we discovered was that in addition to the African-American vote at the end, what, the spike in the major cities is clearly what put JFK over the top. But there was one other factor that, you, that was continuous all the way through the campaign. And that was the votes in these new American communities uh, called suburbs by people who didn't have strong partisan leanings, but who were Catholic. And in community after community across, this, uh, across the country, Kennedy uh, was the first national Democrat to sort of show an ability to penetrate the suburbs. It had nothing to do with economics or taxes or anything. It was just he, he got out the Catholics. Um, as Curtis alluded, I think, it, it fascinated me, studying the Houston appearance, that there was not a syllable in that speech that Kennedy had not been articulating for four years. Uh, the one thing he did was he prepared the battlefield before he went out on it. Uh, we, we found before, about a month before the pivotal primary in West Virginia, uh, we bumped into some paperwork uh, indicating that Bob Kennedy had gotten into a car with uh, the Attorney General of Virginia at the time, a man named William Battle, a family quite prominent in Virginia. His dad had been governor. William Battle had served in the Pacific with JFK. And Bob Kennedy and Bill Battle drove around West Virginia for two or three days a month before the primary, just visiting Protestant ministers. And what they came back with um, was a sense that this wasn't 1928, and that the difference with Kennedy was that he talked about it. Not only that he talked about it, but as if you study the, as we had to do the film and audio of his appearances, he actively encouraged people to ask him about it. Um, and, and that had the effect of, he had one other arrow in his quiver. As I alluded to earlier, he was the first presidential candidate to ever have an actual pollster on his staff. Um, 
we found a canceled check from December of 1957 that Kennedy himself wrote to a young Lou Harris. Um, um, barely 30, a refugee from Elmo Roper's already established uh, organization. Uh, and Mr. Harris, who just died last year, sharp as a tack, deep into his 90s. But we happened to run into just about a file containing just about every poll Mr. Harris conducted over those four years. And the message on religion was fascinating because he, he broke it down. Uh, you know, he, he pretty consistently found about a quarter of the electorate was somewhat concerned about the idea of having a Roman Catholic as our president. But Mr. Harris went further and analyzed that figure to weed out the people who would vote Republican anyway for other reasons. And that enabled him to cut it in half. And he always estimated the size of Kennedy's handicap at about 10% of the electorate. Steep, but uh, doable. The other weapon uh, he had was humor. Um, bigotry is so hard to sustain when you're laughing. <laughs> um, and Kennedy had a few lines that he used quite effectively. One of them uh, I remember hearing, well, encountering in our research involved Al Smith. And he would tell audiences that, you know, it was a crushing defeat for those of us who, who are Catholic. He was the first guy who had gotten the nomination and he, would, he lost uh, in a landslide. But I didn't realize that on the morning after the election, uh, Governor Smith sent a telegram to Pope Pius XI uh, containing a single wor word, unpack. <laughs> <laughs> and hokey though that might sound, this relaxed, confident way of talking about religion took some of the edge off it. But what really stunned us was how early Kennedy realized not only that this was a potentially enormous obstacle, but that the only way to confront obstacles, whether it's being an outsider or being a Catholic in 1960, is by working at it. And the work ethic that he brought to this and all problems uh, really kind of stunned us. He tended to be one of these guys who gets up before the other candidates do and went to bed long after they did. He supposedly was in lousy health, and we could never find any evidence uh, that anything like that affected him. Um, and so uh, it's a pretty good object lesson that when you have a, a political problem facing you, it doesn't hurt to first of all admit it and then to work at it. Sir, and ask anything, just yell stuff. You talked about the, the role of the primaries in, in the election of, of, uh, of Kennedy, but can you talk about the role of his father and connections with the bosses, and uh, in particular, uh, Mayor Daley? We didn't plant the question, but we were very grateful. <laughs> um, there were a number of things that we went into this thing, having heard, like all of you, and then uh, research leading us in a different direction. We could not find any evidence. Mike. We could not find any evidence from the beginning of JFK's career running for Congress in 1946 all the way through the presidential campaign. We couldn't find a lick of evidence that his father, besides the money, had any impact on any significant aspect of the campaign, tactically, strategically, um, multiple examples of, uh, of his advice being ignored, not just by JFK, but by his brothers and his sisters. Um, I think one of the biggest myths about Kennedy was that his dad was pulling the strings. There's a pretty good story. Kennedy used to tell his story from time to time that uh, when he was running for Congress, you know, his old man was old school, ward-type politics. Kennedy was a different kind of politician. But uh, he had already started to make headway in his first race for Congress in 1946, and he wanted some more money to do billboards down the stretch of the campaign. 
and his old man, who already knew how well Kennedy was doing, wouldn't give him the money. And, and what he said was, listen, Jack, I am proud to underwrite your victory, but I'll be damned if I'm going to pay for a landslide. <laughs> <laughs> But he did pay, he, he essentially bought the West Virginia primary. No question the old man's money was used, but uh, his advice, his recommendations were repeatedly rejected. There's one great vignette. Uh, it was at a strategy session in 1960 at, uh, the, the, uh, at Joe Kennedy's place in, in Palm Beach, and uh, the West Virginia primary is about to come up, and he is inveighing against going into West Virginia. He said, you, can't go in there, you know, there are no Catholics in the state, there are all these right-wing Protestants and they'll murder you, et cetera, and stomped. And uh, Jack Kennedy was presiding and he gets up and says, well, we've heard from the ambassador and this is what we're gonna do, we're going into West Virginia. <laughs> um, uh, and, and this happened repeatedly, uh, repeated instances. Uh, Joe Kennedy at one point said, I can't have any conversation with my son about any aspect of foreign policy. We have complete disagreements on foreign policy. So we think if we shattered any one myth, that's the one we think that we did. So thank you for that question. Is there a question there? Yes. Yes, please. Yeah, we've got a question. Thank you all for coming. I'm a graduate of the University of Mississippi and I actually had the privilege of taking your Symbolism in the South course back in 2013. Uh, I'm currently reading a, a book on Richard Nixon and there are allegations in the book of election fraud uh, in Chicago uh, by means of American Joe Kennedy's mayor. money. And I, I was hoping if the uh, research that you found confirmed that or dissuaded you from making that to, you know. In Chicago? Yeah, you're talking about the 60, the 60 return. Is that Jack Farrell's book you're reading? Yeah. He's a, he's a colleague, we're all Boston Globe guys. Uh, we did Kennedy, he did Nixon. Uh, Tom, take that one. You're good yes, on it. <laughs> you know, uh, one of the things that JFK pioneered in that a lot of people don't know, he was one of the great question dodgers. Uh, in forms, it, it, they could get. I, I've always called it down through the years, Kennedy speak, where you know, where if you say it, and then you can't really tell if they're saying anything. But you know, it looks like somebody's speaking, but they're really not. And uh, one of his great lines was always uh, that that's an absolutely fabulous question. And as a matter of fact, there's going to be someone here next week to talk on that very <laughs> talk on that very uh, topic. Um, we took a long look at Illinois, and we took a long look at Texas. And the first thing that struck me was after all these years in Chicago, if you want to talk Chicago, still talking about the same two precincts. Uh, one, uh, one in, some of you may have heard of Danny Rostenkowski, one in, one in his territory up on the northwest side, and one on the uh, south side, African American. Neither of which comes within a country mile of the 10,000 vote majority that was officially counted. In all these years, there's never been another precinct polling place where votes cast exceeds the number of registrants, which is usually the first clue that something's, <laughs> something's going on. Secondly, uh, people forget there was a very spirited contest for state's attorney in Cook County that fall. And a Republican held the office, and he was very narrowly beaten by a Democrat. And the Republican also cried foul. And they had a recount going uh, for about a month after the election in Cook County. And one of the odd discoveries in the recount is that Kennedy's margin went up by 1,500 votes. <laughs> and then there was a study done by uh, some academics uh, at the Chicago campus of the University of Illinois of the uh, mob-run precincts, 
which, if you know Chicago, are on the, just to the west of the loop uh, downtown. And uh, what, what struck the fellow who researched it was that the turnout in these precincts was lower than it had been in 1956. So, you know, at some point, the prosecution has to accept the burden of proof. And it just strikes us that after all these years, uh, it's not been skimpy enough to merit serious consideration. Same thing, by the way, in Texas. It's the same county. Uh, not far from here, actually. It was Sam Rayburn's uh, home county. Uh, now there, the disparity is almost three percentage points, well over uh, roughly 50,000 votes. Um, and again, you'd think after 60 years, somebody would be able to come up with something more than just one rural county. So, uh, uh, and then, you know, on the flip side, uh, those of us who've been in this game for a long time, have certainly heard a little bit about what goes on in southern Illinois. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's, uh, okay, the Democrats control Chicago, but uh, you know, Republicans contro control downstate, and, and they're crooked as hell too in Illinois. And, and both sides, it, it is a very crooked state, and it has a history of, of, uh, uh, kind of questionable elections. And one of the things that went on in 60 was Mayor Daley was withholding the vote in Chicago, waiting to see what uh, Republicans are going to deliver downstate. So uh, they both were holding back uh, the, the, the precincts that they control to see. Uh, what, well, that's why the result was so late in coming in. Daley wouldn't release it, and, and uh, uh, Republicans downstate were, were waiting on each other. and. Uh, they blinked and they <laughs> threw in their numbers and uh, daily called have, them and raised them. Can I tell the vote buying story? Sure. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, you know, the, the other aspect of 1960 that uh, advocates of clean politics, which we certainly all favor. Um, of course, not as much fun to write about. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> we, it's much more fun for people like Curtis and me when everybody's crying foul. But as Curtis alluded to earlier, uh, there was a lot of cash rolling around in West Virginia before that truly pivotal primary. Uh, not all of it Kennedy. Uh, Lyndon Johnson was running uh, behind the scenes uh, by then, and um, uh, upwards of 30 or $40,000 slipped into West Virginia from Johnson. Uh, during that month. But what Curtis said is the more important point, namely that Kennedy really did have the cash. And we had the pleasure of spending a lot of time with the person uh, from the so-called Irish Mafia who was in charge of actually passing out the cash in, in, in West Virginia. A wonderful man I love dearly named Dick Donahue. Uh, who went on to a fabulous uh, <coughs> career in business. He was one of the first presidents of Nike, actually. Um, but in West Virginia, uh, he was responsible for doling out the, what they call in politics walking around money uh, to local power brokers, who in West Virginia at the time tended to be sheriffs. And um, the deal was, if you were willing to put Kennedy's name on your palm card. So in other words, the, the local bosses would hand out cards that had the names of their recommended candidates on them, and most people would follow the, follow the guidance and vote accordingly. And uh, the deal was, Dick explained to us, that if you were going to slate Kennedy in your county, you got 35 grand in cash for your walking around money at the end of the campaign. And 35 grand was a, f a good sum of money in 1960. But that led to another question that obsessed me. And that was, if you wanted to buy a vote in West Virginia, how much did it cost? <laughs> and finally, after some hemming and hawing, Dick was dying at the time, but he did 
explain in depth how it worked. The sheriffs basically were the ones who, who did it. And in West Virginia, for that primary, if you were willing to declare for Kennedy, you got uh, $2 and a half pint of branded whiskey. If it was moonshine, you got a pint. And that's what a vote was worth in West Virginia in 1960. Kennedy won by 20 percentage points. So the need for this is really questionable. But um, a lot of people had dirty fingers in 1960, not just the Kennedy people. Time for one more question, then we're going to do book signing. Yes, right here. Uh, I look around the room and I see a lot of baby boomers. And our parents were involved or served in World War II. Did you find that the uh, PT-109 hero status compared to Nixon's not so much was part of their strategy in the uh, campaign? And I, was it effective I, if it was? Yeah, I don't think they used that. Uh, well, they, they used it. Where he really uh, exploited that was when he ran for Congress the first time. And uh, he kind of established himself uh, uh, this heroic stature as a, a very young man at the time in 1946 when he won his House seat. And uh, of course, his uh, uh, role in World War II was uh, more heroic than Nixon. I mean, Nixon's in the, both in the Navy, Nixon allegedly spent most of his time playing poker. And uh, 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 but uh, yeah, I, I, it was. It, it was unquestionably helpful, but I, Tom, I don't remember any unduly uh, uh, you know, trying to. Less, uh, rather than identify that specific part of Kennedy's biography, um, uh, try this on. Maybe it's a way to wind down a little bit. Um, it was a cultural phenomenon, 1960. Um, I mean, the torch really did pass, didn't it? <laughs> um, and one of the symbols of the torch was service uh, in the war. And um, Curtis mentions, so right, 1946, there were, I mean, you can identify, God, 20 or so uh, young veterans who took the plunge in 1946. Richard Nixon among them, right? Yeah. And by two years later, Jerry Ford, uh, one of the, uh, Kennedy had no trouble on the floor of the House in the 40s and early 50s uh, talking to uh, fellow vets. Some of the people who backed him, uh, who held prominent office, my favorite uh, from Illinois, uh, Paul, Senator Paul Douglas, God rest his soul, was a legitimate war hero. Uh, and people couldn't understand why this devout liberal is backing Jack Kennedy. Well, that's why. <laughs> um, and I think that, you know, how did he put it in the inaugural address, uh, you know, the first president born in the 20th century? Uh, well, I think without stealing from our pal Brokaw, the first of this generation of Americans who went through the Depression, went through the war, were impatient to get ahead when they got out, that that was part of an aura that surrounded him much more than his voice or his hair or his looks. And the idea that he was the first from this collection of Americans to be elected president kind of makes a little sense in retrospect, doesn't it? Listen, we've just been entertained by two great writers and, as we learned tonight, two great storytellers. And so my question, before you come and sign this great book, which, by the way, I will tell you, has a lot of Arkansas in it. It has a lot of Mississippi in it, as we might expect little Faubus, a little Fulbright, so it's worth reading for Arkansas history. What's the next project between you? Where are we going next? What's your next one? Come on. You asked me all those tough questions, I, 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 Curtis. I'm Arkansas, but uh, next Saturday in Oxford.
No. What? No, I, uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to stay my way to another one. Well, I understand that, and I'm coming to see you next week. So, <laughs> and, I, so, uh, and, and let me, I mean, it's not generally known, but I married. Can you hear me now? Yeah. It's, it's not generally known, but I married Mississippi. My wife is from a clan um, that currently is based around Batesville, um, four for a ton of, ton of people. And I've been coming down and bothering Curtis at Ole Miss for, for 20 years. Uh, and people don't know this, but the two of us are the conspirators who came up with the idea and, and made it happen to have the presidential debate between John McCain and, Jim, and Barack Obama at Ole Miss, which gave, me an, which gave me an opportunity on a radio program some of you may have heard called Thacker Mountain Radio, one of the, um, uh, to stand before a full crowd in the square in Oxford and say that we had done this with the debate simply because I wanted to stand before a few thousand Oxfordians and finally get to say, are you ready? <laughs> well, I'm for Arkansas when we play. <laughs> but we are ready to sign this book, and it's a great one. Let's thank Tom and Curtis for being here.